Today's guest on the podcast is a visionary who soared high, an adventurer who fell hard and picked himself up to carry on. I am delighted to welcome to the show the person who made aviation history by enabling ordinary Indians to fly, Captain G.R. Gopinath. Gopi, obviously there was a negative fallout when your airline businesses failed. People blamed you for selling out on your dream when Air Deccan merged with Kingfisher. And when Deccan 360 closed, you couldn't repay loans and you had a lot of financial problems. But you seem to have become a hero all over again thanks to the film based on your life, Sururai Potru. You know, it won the National, National Award. Film Awards, including Best Film, Best uh, Actor, Best, best Actress, Best Screenplay, director. Yeah, director, many things. So do you feel uh, you've been vindicated in a way with the, your story reaching the masses? Yeah, in the sense that, you know, even to be fair to Malia, because he made mistakes, he took my airline. And the agreement was that uh, there will be two separate airlines and he will run the Kingfisher Airlines as a full service airline and we'll have a Deccan, which will be a low cost airline as a separate entity. That is the agreement. But uh, after he came in and he became the larger shareholder than me, I won't say he cheated me. Maybe he cheated me of my dreams, but didn't cheat me of money. He felt that uh, his model, because he was embarrassed about the low cost model, you know, uh, so he did... Uh, he didn't give him a kick. And he also thought that, you know, by making it a full service model, adding more frills, it will be a better airline with bigger revenue. So we had a big fallout because he told me once, you know, Gopi, people are ashamed to travel by Edeka. That's why I want to change the brand. I said, people may hide uh, the tag if you are a guy who do not want to be seen as going traveling a low cost airline. Even in London today, the biggest airlines are the low cost airlines. And they are in profit. But uh, that's there. When you carry, somebody may carry a Louis Vuitton bag and uh, they, uh, and if he goes and buys some other bag, he may not want to show it, right? But the thing is, Bajaj uh, may ride a scooter, but he drives any pens, right? So I said the airline generates profit. You know, I said it's a Udupi in the sky. But he didn't believe in it and he changed the model. I think that was the probably beginning of the end. And he also lost focus. Uh, he was a CEO, but he didn't have the time for the airline. Contrary to Billy, of course, he was flamboyant, he was a ladies' man, a ladies' fellow over him. I never saw him hitting on any woman. But he was into Formula One, he was into cricket, he was into politics, he was into a lot of other businesses. King so size he life. Yeah, he, he, he truly lived that. <coughs> so he didn't have time for the airline. And so I had a big fight and I said, I do appoint a CEO full time and give him, the, give him the freedom. He didn't do that. So decisions couldn't be taken. And the cost went beyond the roof. And uh, he would boast saying that, you know, his, his liquor tap would never dry. But of course, even then his debt was compared to many that big tycoons now were having debt of 90,000 crores, 100,000 crores. You know, you've seen it it's in public knowledge, Anil Ambani, for example, or SR. Of course, the government helped them in clearing the loans by helping the banks to renegotiate the terms. In his case, I think he was arrogant. Uh, he didn't attend to the business, but the debt was only about 6,000 6, crores. And he didn't have to run away uh, from the country. He should have sat here and faced it. And I think uh, almost everybody goes through crisis in life of one type or the other. Personal tragedies, business failure. As everybody knows, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the greatest president of the world ever had, um, who, emas- who took personal risk and emancipated America from slavery. Before he became a president, he was a businessman. He had started a business and he had failed and he had a nervous breakdown. The thing is that you are a failure only when you quit. You're not a failure when you fail or fall. I think everybody must remember that. And uh, maybe you have made mistakes and so you pay for it. So take it in your chin. So as Victor Hugo said, I think um, the glory of man is not in never falling or failing, but to rise each time you fall. I think that is the art of life. That is the art of business too. How do you keep going after the setbacks you've had? What gives you the resilience? So I have have had uh, failures, but I got up each time I fell because uh, the secret to life, I think, is enthusiasm every day. Uh, In a sense, I also learned it as a farmer when I also looked at the farmers today. The toughest life in India are probably the farmers. They have floods, they have drought, they have Famines, they have 
crop failures because of excess rains or drought or bad seeds or pests but he never loses hope right he harnesses the plow and with his wife in tow he goes to the field in the morning even today goes to the field in the morning and plows never doubting that the seed he sows will not sprout never doubting that the sun will not rise never doubting that the plant will not come to harvest he suffers but he doesn't stop sowing the field so i think all of us must learn from that and anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur especially or wants to achieve anything you know you can't achieve that if you do not have optimism apart from big dreams and hard work to commit to the dream you also need to be optimistic uh, optimism that things will mend things will be all right tomorrow and that requires a kind of a generosity and magnanimity of heart to be cynical all the time to condemn everything of course there are there is corruption there is um, venality in politics bureaucratic apathy is there it's always there i always quote this purandara dasa 1000 years ago said satyavantarige idu kalavalla i say this is not the age of honest people so it has always been there but there are also good people so you have to learn to have that magnanimity of heart to admire the good things and as camu said that even in the midst of the desert you should pause and uh, delight in uh, if you see a flower yeah. so we need to have that kind of generosity of spirit not only to rise and move generosity of spirit to admire the, the good things you know i i tell this so that you know, young people who are sometimes they get into depression or they get into skepticism saying that you know today you need political a lot of youngsters come to me i don't have connections i don't have political friends i don't have rich father you know i'm not getting a job uh, today most people are not begging many of them come to me because they want a job and or they want to start a business they are not able to get through and i say this uh, so that they know that when i decided to start the helicopter company all with my friend uh, captain sam it took us 3 years to get a license and fortunately I had a good partner a uh, very noble guy and uh, he subsumed his ego and allowed me to be a mad man so i i never stopped i mean we had no timeline saying that we'll do it for 6 months and if it doesn't work we'll go back so i told him then both will fail if you say i'll quit my job only after after right. after i succeed in the other one i said that will not succeed and you will not you will fail in your present job you have to give it everything yeah. you got you have to be obsessed with, to the point of madness you must become the dream and the dream is in a very vedantic way there should be no duality i think we are not bench uh, somebody asked him you know i want to be a violinist what what should i do he said you don't ask you start play so you have to be obsessed to that point of madness so that you are consumed by it then you know it will happen that doesn't mean you have to be pig headed and uh, you have to recognize that things are not going wrong and change your strategy you change your tactics that are the, that are the mechanics but that doesn't mean you have failed as an entrepreneur you have failed as a on that particular business i think there is a very famous thing which i say often edison was someone who came and asked him and said they say you failed 10000 times he said no i didn't fail 10000 times i discovered 10000 ways in which it does not work so you have to have that attitude and i think einstein very famously said i'm not a genius but i'm infinitely more curious and i stay with the problem longer i think the thing is that you have to be curious about the world not just your own business and uh, staying with the problem longer to, to persistence is more important than uh, talent because talent you can't be proud about it strong arrogant about it because it's a gift somebody is good at writing somebody is good at playing a violin somebody is good in basketball or tennis it is a gift but even for a genius hard work and persistence there's no shortcut to that i want to ask you gopi if given a chance to start over would you do things differently yeah definitely but i think um, is a futile question because in that sense of course looking back in hindsight all of us are wiser um, i would have but you you do not know at that point in time you play the cards that are on the table yeah yeah you you, you have dealt with some cards is how you deal with it at that circumstance the kind of situation i was in i made mistakes i was uh, maybe i could have been a better husband better father better friend better manager my secretary sisla was so much more blessed uh, once in one interview they asked, they asked the bbc i think they interviewed her what do you think he said he is he's always angry he's always impatient you know <laughs> i would tell my people <laughs> sisla yes, said that <laughs> <laughs> so i have tell my people my pilots if somebody calls for a helicopter 
it's because it's urgent. I said, he won't call for a helicopter. So I said, pick up the phone before it rings. <laughs> it must have been <laughs> something <laughs> unimaginable to deal with in the office. Let's talk about your twist with politics. Yeah. So you contested elections twice, am I right? Yeah. So would you like to do so again, if given an opportunity? <laughs> the opportunity uh, once was given to me. The other time, I took it myself in the sense that uh, the first time, you know, before I got into aviation after my army days, uh, I took to farming. And I was I was in a farm for 10 years. I was in a tent. I got married there. My daughter, Pallavi, you know, was born there. We lived in a tent, actually. We were living hand to mouth. And uh, it was full of uh, challenges. Like all farmers, I got into debt and got out of debt. So I eventually cracked the challenge of, you know, farmers getting into debt. And I found new ways of doing things. Probably the I got into low-cost farming. And low-cost farming is eco-friendly farming. And probably the seeds of my aviation was low-cost sale and sown in my farm, as someone said. So I became a very famous farmer, which many people do not know about. I did a lot you of work. the Rolex award yeah, yeah, I got for it. farming? So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, You're still wearing it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I did some work and uh, that uh, got, got me, or it did also got me fame. So a lot of people knew me and I used to be in the paper, I used to write on agriculture and things like that. At that time, you know, uh, I was contacted uh, at that time by the, by the RSS, actually, because there's no BJP in Karnataka and who was actually a chartered accountant member of the RSS. He called me and said, you know, why don't you become president of BJP Hassan? Uh, because he said, we are trying to recruit people. And then BJP had only two MPs in parliament. You know, they had left the Jan Sangh. After the Janata Dal experiment, uh, Janata Party experiment failed. Then the, they said, uh, you know, but they, so we want to get people, new people, professionals, doctors, army officers, engineers. So that's when just just from Singh, uh, who was in the army, became a joined and became a finance minister eventually. Vice by government. Ishwan Sina was in IAS, he joined. So like that. So when I joined, it was a party with a difference then. So I became a president of the BJP for Hassan for about uh, five years. And Vice by came during that time to Hassan as a president. He came home. Bhagavis heard uh, dinner with him. I got into an argument with him. Uh, but anyway, I contested uh, from the rural constituency. Everybody said, you contest from Hassan, you're a Brahmin, uh, you know, there are more Brahmins in the city, more Hassan traders. Yes. Yeah, the more traders, you'll win from there. But I said, no, I said, I'm in my farm and contest from my farm. I had this kind of uh, optimism and arrogance that I'll win from my constituency because it's a farming, a rural constituency, and I knew the place well. But I lost uh, badly, very badly, because those days, uh, there was only Janata Party, which was Devagoda, and then there was Congress in Hassan, it was Shikantaya versus Devagoda. They were very strong across Karnataka. There was the only two parties. So I lost, and then I also discovered during that time that the people who come behind a politician, you know, I, I became a president because nobody wanted that job, and not because I was a dynamic guy or something like that. But people f- who follow a politician, and he goes from, you know, we had f- 450 villages. And uh, how, how do you go from one village to another? I don't know anybody there. Uh, so you have to have some chelas around. And the guys who come with you are people who are, who are others, farmers, other, other people in the village, normally without a job. There are three children in a family. One is into farming. One has become a bus conductor, KSRTC or a clerk in some government office. And the third, you know, is a little more aggressive and uh, ruffian. He gets into politics. So he comes behind the MLA. And you or, give them favors? Yeah, government. in the sense they come because I knew it. That they come because when I become an MLA, I'll give them the contracts. I'll give them the local contracts for drainage, water, roads, you know, all these panchayat funds. Right. Because panchayat Raj had become very strong uh, during uh, after mm-hmm. Ramakrishna Hegde. So uh, Zilla Panchayat was there. So they will come run behind because they want to, also that is a stepping stone for them. Right. To contest for the local panchayat elections. And they'll come behind you uh, because the, they also, many of them become, um, you know, doubts. See, if you go to any minister's house or you go to Vidhan Sauda Naam, if you go to the first story building, anytime, there are a thousand people there. 
Why are they there? Because the jobs are not getting done at the normal cost. You don't see them when you go to London or uh, USA you know, or Europe. You don't find people in the government office. Hardly anybody there. Here, you go to the chief minister's house or any minister's house. At five in the morning, there are a thousand. You go to the multi-storied buildings where all the officers are there, or the IAS and Tasildas. There are a thousand people there. That's because your jobs are not done. So you need to go and push the files you know, through bro- brokers. So these guys will eventually become these kind of brokers will say, I'll get this job done. So they'll bring that guy to Bangalore to the MLA's house. He said, no, he wants a transfer. He wants a fair price shop. He wants a gas agency. Mm-hmm. So I realized that at the least I had to do it to them was to give them breakfast, lunch, then they go back home. The father will kick him out. He said, you can't stay at home without working. I'm not going to feed you, right? So he, he asked me, so I had an old car and I used to take them with me. I about eight, nine of them. And we would stop by the, in the village uh, roadside shops. And even there, it was uh, Anna Sambar, you know, rice and sambar, it was cost about three rupees, I remember. So if you have five, six people or eight people, it cost you 20 bucks. So it was, that's my own diesel. So my, I was myself, you know, hand to mouth. And so I realized uh, that I'll have to dip my hand into the till if I had to continue. Fortunately, I lost maybe. Or <laughs> unfortunately, I do not know. Uh, so I realized that if I continue and if I become a minister, two things. One is I have to entertain all these guys. Always, in all respects, I have to entertain them. I have to see them because they, will, they have come and worked for you. you know? There is a personal right. loyalty. And that's the reason sometimes when you find that some minister, it could be, it could be the prime minister, it could be any other minister, when they do favors, and I think probably he's done it because in his bad times, they have stood by him. Right? Exactly. So there is a human element to that. So I said, you know, I think best is to do something on my own, you know. By which time I already had uh, an Enfield motorcycle dealership. I had a, because my farm was not paying me. I had set up an Enfield motorcycle dealership. I had eight branches, the agriculture consultancy farm. I had a micro irrigation farm for, along with agriculture consultancy. I had a Woodpea hotel. So I'd done a lot of things. So I had a, so I, I was an entrepreneur by nature and also by necessity. And uh, so I said, let me, do something. So all them, all of them were my stepping stones to success. But even on the day I lost, I was already planning what's my next step. Because that uh, election gave me a lot of confidence. So I knew all the people who won the elections because I contested against them. And uh, so it's a great learning. And I also realized that there's so much of poverty, so much of uh, work to be done. And I said, my God, I said, even if I, though I went and made all these speeches, I said, if I win, I said, how am I going to we we'll all those promises. Create jobs because there's no money in the, in the government because the private sector was still not that strong. And uh, we had four native villages, there are no drainage, there's no uh, drinking water, there are no hospitals, the schools are broken. I said, even if they give the entire state government's budget, I will not be able to fulfill it. So I said, the best is to go out and create jobs and do something on your own. So I left. By which time I had made a name in aviation, I had an aviation company. And uh, that's when I decided, uh, they co- approached me, both BJP at that time, especially, and said to contest. Because the other party? And Congress. Okay. Um, they were ready to, BJP especially was, ready to, was very keen on a contest, because it was very well known. This time as an aviation man, to contest in Bangalore. But I thought, you know, I, I, I must contest, because by which time I had got dissolution with all parties. I said, all are, all are the same. And uh, I felt, you know, what we need is um, one was excessive uh, appeasement politics of casteist politics of Congress, the other one was communal politics. And I felt that uh, best would be to contest as an independent. And my dream, which was not realized, was that if people are fighting on caste, but if, if I get all the middle class people, the amorphous middle class people, the lower middle class people who are working in Bangalore, which is the major company, to get them together, they'll become the largest vote bank. Right. Right. The, the middle class and the lower middle class, uh, they'll become the largest vote bank. So I went to all these Infosys and I went to, they all gave me platform, Google, G, Microsoft, and also all the shops, schools, colleges. And uh, I also organized uh, debates like in America. Mm-hmm. So we had four debates. One was in Infosys, moderated by Pi, Pi, another in another place where the three of us debated, you know, the Janta Party, Congress, myself. But I think uh, what I realized was, because people were not voting, only about 45% were voting in Bangalore. Like in my apartments, you know, if there are 600 people, 
only about uh, 40 are registered. The rest, uh, out of the 40, only about 5 will come and vote. You know, none of this straight up. You know, in my election, only about 48% voted. Even this election, only in Bangalore, they voted 47, 48. So most people, they will go and wait for four hours in the Tasilda's office for their property, but they will not go and wait to register their votes. You know, that is the impatient. That is the, but, but the poor people are that way much better. They, they go and vote regardless. If there are two parties which are evil, are bad, two candidates which are bad, one, then they choose the lesser of the evil. But they go and vote. They're not indifferent. They don't go on a vacation. Yeah. So I thought if the 40% come together, because you require only 35% to win, because their votes are split. If all these people come together, that will be the largest vote bank. And I mean. But the, the, unfortunately, they never came to vote. <laughs> so is that the end of your political dreams? <laughs> I think so, but uh, they never say never. <laughs> they never say never. If you were given a nomination to the Rajya Sabha, would you take it? I'm not sure because you have to be a subservient to that party's ideology, which is how most people get into Rajya Sabha. So I'm not sure. Okay. So Gopi, you've led such an action-packed life as a soldier, a farmer, a serial entrepreneur a politician, you're also a music lover. And uh, do you continue to listen to music? Do you also sing? Or no, do you I don't sing. I learned Brazangam for some time. <laughs> but I, I realized how I didn't have the talent. I miss those huge concerts we used to have at your Jakur. Yeah. <laughs> those, those were really now, uh, for the last 15 years, I've been hosting a concert in my village, uh, free for uh, all for all communities. Uh, I host a classical a Karnatic or, or Hindustani music. In the village temple on the bank of the river in Guru, every year, all these people are coming from there, Team Krishna, on the big Karnataka. When message. does that happen? It's in the come next time, it is in the February, usually. Oh, end of January or February. On, yeah. the, on the day before the Rathotsa, right. where we get a big crowd. Right. I've been hosting that. I also sponsor concerts now and then in the uh, Ganesha festival and Ram Nami festival. And uh, befriended many artists. And uh, in my book, there is one or two of them on uh, communalization of music, for example, where I said that uh, when um, T.M. Krishna sang, uh, I mean, TM, when, when some people sang in a ch- church at the institution uh, about th- three, four years ago, the Hindutva people attacked them, saying, how can you go and sing in a Christian institution? It will be uh, encouraging conversions. And then Krishna, who had not sung on that occasion, he came up and said, why not? He said, uh, you know, music is beyond religion. So as a challenge, I will sing one, uh, I'll release one video every month, one on Islam and one on Christ and one on uh, uh, Tyagaraja, Hindu also. And in Bangalore, Ramnami, I remember Andi Jasraj, who used to come and stay in my house, he sang uh, for four hours, three hours from 45 minutes once. And suddenly I realized that he was singing in the Ramnami, in front of the deity, Allahu Mehrban. And then he said, Hari and Allah and Om, and he fused it. And um, Bade Gholam Ali Khan was famous for his uh, Hari Om Tatsat. So I've written on, on those things that, you know, a, a true Hindu is one who embraces the world, embraces all faiths, because he sees himself in everything. That is the true spirit of Hinduism. In fact, even if you go to the Belur temple or many of the Hindu temples, Buddha is one of the deities. The avatar. Yeah, Hinduism embraces. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes I get disturbed. I feel sad that uh, the way it's being uh, Hindu it, yeah, mis- misinterpreted. Yeah. Yeah. Or all of them. We can't compete with Islamic fundamentalism. Then what was the difference? We have to condemn and root out Islamic fundamentalism in this country as well as Hindu fundamentalism. Yeah, fundamentalism of any religion is not good. But like you said, rivalry is certainly not the way to go. Okay, so now uh, you are a newspaper columnist. Mm-hmm. What motivates you to write on so many different topics? <laughs> yeah, I write on um, economy and business and write on politics, uh, governance or absence of it, communal harmony or the lack of it, and on society uh, and reflections on, on general things which are not related to politics. Is there so a that uh, keeps me busy and also because I have done so many things, I was in I was, I was an agriculturist, I was in the army, I went through a war, I had uh, small businesses, I had a stock working company, I had a, as I told you, I had to be a hotel, a motorcycle dealership, agriculture consultancy, and aviation, and politics, so 
been there, done that. <laughs> Is there a sequel so to right your my... memoir in the offing? Simply yeah. fly part two. Uh, simply fly again. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful title. I would buy that book. <laughs> Thank you. Stay tuned for the next episode. The captain Gopinath and I will continue talking about what ails the airline industry in India and how more Indians can simply keep flying.